Welcome to today's Ocean Connector, an opportunity for our ocean community to come together, share ideas, and discuss and make connections. My name is Melanie Natto, and I'm the CEO of the Center for Ocean Ventures and Entrepreneurship. I'm also really excited today to be the host for 2021's first guest of our Ocean Connectors, Mr. Ron Allum. But before we get started in our conversation, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Cox and Palmer, Killam Properties, and our founding partner, Irving Shipbuilding. Please enjoy. Our first guest for 2021 is Ron Allum. Mr. Allum is many things, but let me list a few here. He's an Australian broadcast technician, an innovator for deep, deep sea explorations, one of the world's most experienced cave divers, an explorer and adventurer, Australian of the Year, Australian Geographic Society Adventurer of the Year, a designer and builder of submersibles, a self-taught engineer, and he's also got a couple of nicknames, one being the professor, and he's also been termed as a bona fide genius. Ron, thank you for joining us for the Ocean Connector. How are you doing? How are you? Uh, I'm not doing too bad, thanks. <laughs> Great. Well, Ron, I'm excited to uh, have this conversation with you. Uh, your career has spanned many things. And uh, I'd like to kick it off by maybe allowing you to talk about the early days and how you, you started off your career. How did you get into, uh, into working and exploring in the oceans? Uh, that's a really hard uh, place to start, I, I think, but um, uh, I grew up in um, Sydney's eastern suburbs. Uh, I spent most of my time at the beach. Um, yeah, sort of a little bit later, I, I joined the Boy Scouts um, and found myself caving. And uh, ooh, soon after, you know, I started a career in broadcasting. Um, yeah, I started uh, going on... Um, uh, university um, uh, caving trips and found myself uh, really working with um, uh, scientists and researchers and academics um, exploring caves and it was partly mostly fun um, yeah partly an adventure that I'd, I seem to enjoy and uh, it was also yeah helping um, yeah other students and um, academics uh, further their research into uh, chemistry and the geology of caves. Really neat. So my myself personally, I, uh, I'm not really good with being underwater at all. So you've gone into depths that are six kilometers uh, deep underwater. Can you talk about what that feel like feels like? <laughs> to be so deep in the ocean diving? Yeah, um, my diving career, um, yeah, it's it, it was, um, look, I, I spent a lot of time in the eastern suburbs. I was a surfer. Um, yeah, my arms were too short to carry a surfboard um, or the older style surfboard. Uh, so I used to, um, I use a bodyboard and I just loved the, the surf. Um, where I really got into the diving, the scuba diving, uh, was through the caving. Um, we would go caving, we'd go to the, what people would say would be the end of a cave, but it usually ended in a, uh, a lake of water. Um, and really, you know, for the dry caver, there's really no way on, uh, except either to hold your breath and hope there's an air chamber um, <laughs> soon after, or... You, you know, you don scuba equipment and, uh, yeah, we I sort of got involved in, I suppose, a, 
a bit of a pioneering of uh, cave diving in Australia. And yeah, I soon found myself um, living in um, uh, Adelaide so I could get down to an area, um, Mount Gambier, um, whereas I spent, I suppose, a lot of my years, um, you know, getting involved in cave diving and, um, uh, yeah, looking at the equipment and uh, going into new sites. And, yeah, that was pretty exciting. Um, my adventure into the really deep stuff uh, didn't really start until, um, yeah, well into my yeah, broadcast career. Um, and it really did follow on from the cave diving and the cut and those cave diving adventures out the Nullarbor Plain um, when we when we actually uh, undertook to um, uh, do a film um, on one of our expeditions in the Nullarbor, and that was um, a, a film called Nullarbor Dreaming. Um, and uh, a number of years went past, but uh, eventually the producer of that series, uh, yeah, was headhunted by James Cameron, and that's when um, yeah, my adventures uh, into the deep sea really started. Yeah, so so um, obviously I'm going to go there. Um, you have worked with James Cameron for over 20 years plus. You were involved in uh, the movie The Titanic, other of his expeditions. So that connection with James Cameron, how did that really crystallize? Yeah, um, it... I wasn't actually involved in the the movie uh, per se um, of Titanic. Um, Jim did that, I think, in '95. I think it was released '96. I might have my years wrong, um, but yeah, I got involved with um, James Cameron in uh, year 2000. Um, he was actually in development of a camera for his Avatar um, film, and I, yeah, when. I suppose, yeah, stepping back a, no, just a few steps there. Um, yeah, Andrew, uh, yeah, our producer, or, yeah, um, I'd, I'd sort of, sorry, I got involved in, you know, broadcasting and, you know, like I was a broad, broadcaster, a really behind the scenes uh, technician, um, yeah, a person who would um, uh, interface uh, the technical equipment and there's many many changes yeah throughout my career from you know analog cameras to digital cameras um, I even started out in the black and white era and then eventually <laughs> going to color so I've had a lot of um, you know experience uh, with the broadcasting <clears throat> but uh, when uh, my friend Andrew um, was headhunted by James Cameron uh, it was Andrew that said you know if we need a, a technical expert on this, um, uh, on, on what you're trying to achieve, and yeah, I want to get um, yeah my friend Ronnie Allen uh, involved, and so that, that's how I came to be um, yeah working with uh, James Cameron. Um, it all started in the year 2000. Um, as mentioned, uh, Jim was in development of a, a camera for um, Avatar, and most normal um, film producers, you know, most James Camerons out there uh, would actually trial a camera in a more um, you know, sedate atmosphere, but uh, Jim decided that he wanted to take it back to Titanic, take this new camera, um, you know, a, a digital 3D system, put it on a, a, a Russian Mir diving submersible and take it down you know, three and a half thousand metres uh, and revisit Titanic. And yeah, that, that expedition was in 2001 and it was quite successful. And on that very first dive that uh, Jim was able to achieve, he filmed more of Titanic in one dive than he did in all the dives that he did previous uh, when he was making the movie. Oh. So after Titanic, you uh, you also worked with him on another dive, which call, was called the Deep Seas Challenger, and that was going in the Mariana Trench, 
and you develop the submersible for that. So can you speak to that and just the, the scale yeah. of what that feat was from a development of a submersible uh, going in 11 kilometers deep? Yeah, um, yeah. I suppose um, you don't just get an invitation to build a, yeah, a world-class um, yeah, diving submersible. Um, it, it grew over a number of years. Uh, we did a number of exhibitions, including to the uh, Bismarck, where I did my first really deep dive, and that was 5,000 metres. Um, we also did another... Um, Another uh, expedition uh, it was back to Titanic, but it was Discovery Channel wanted to do a special um, 25th anniversary, and we actually um, set up a broadcast system where Jim went live from Titanic. Uh, so I think having built up a, a rapport, uh, I suppose, with uh, Jim, that um, and and also spending you know, quite a bit of time you know, on a ship. Uh, sometimes you're travelling slowly, sometimes you're spending a bit too much time in the galley or um, you know, because of weather, you know, you're skirting storms or, or whatever. Um, you, get, you conjure up a lot of ideas and you do a lot of sketches on paper napkins. Um, and I, I suppose it was during those times that we sort of thought, well, you know, what if, you know, uh, could we go to the bottom of the Mariner's Trench? You know, it hadn't been visited since uh, 69, I believe, um, you know, um, you know in, a, in, a, in a submarine called the Trieste. But that used aviation gasoline for buoyancy, and you couldn't do that nowadays. So, you know, we had to, um, you know, with modern technology, you know, there's, you know, things like syntactic foam and, you um, yeah, we started pioneering some, uh, you yeah, making electronics work at pressure. Uh, so we, we further, um, I, I spent a little bit of time in the first one or two years uh, when we decided to do, um, you yeah, Deep Sea Challenger, uh, looking at the possibilities of, of making an affordable submarine uh, that could dive to those sorts of depths. Um, I should call it a submersible. Uh, submarine is often regarded as a big military uh, device, but um, submersibles tend to be require a um, uh, a support ship. Um, it's launched from a ship and it comes back to the ship, but um, you know it, it's capable of um, you know extreme depths. So yeah, we set out to do that, and um, a number of years later. Um, and also a number of challenges later, um, yeah, we were able to dive uh, Deep Sea Challenger to the uh, bottom of the Maranas Trench. So all good ideas start on a paper napkin. When, how long did it take from going from the paper napkin to actually doing the, uh, the deep sea exploration? Uh, look, the first images that I have are probably uh, over 10 years old um, at the time, um, yeah, when we pulled it off. Um, but work didn't really start until, um, you yeah, know, we, we did some initial research. Um, but, yeah, I was working, I suppose, uh, silently uh, behind the scenes for a number of years, probably um, 2006 through to 2010. We really put the team together in 2011 and dived in uh, you know, 2012. So there's a number of years where I was literally working um, uh, just myself um, and my wife. Um, we would just be working in, um, I, I, we designed a small pressure vessel so we could test um, a lot of equipment, particularly the electronics and batteries. Um, working with this little pressure vessel in my laundry or our laundry <laughs> and uh yeah it's just, just working secretly you know, pumping this this um uh pressure vessel up at the night time you know leaving the apparatus in in the pressure vessel coming uh, waking up in the morning and and looking at the results and yeah all, all this took um you know quite a few years and um yeah based on um uh, 
a uh, certain amount of successes, you know, uh, Jim, you know, you're able to keep the, um, the sub build going, I guess. One of the things that I've read is that uh, you've used the cake mixer when you were developing the uh, the foam that you call the coating for your submersible. Is that yeah. true? Um, it was, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, this syntactic foam, um, it's a mixture of hollow glass microspheres and epoxy resin. Um, most manufacturers uh, construct this material in a vacuum. It means it has to be liquid uh, when you pour it into moulds um, and it's important not to get air into the mix otherwise it, it compromises a mix. Um, unfortunately those syntactic foams we found would um, uh, that they weren't uniform, they weren't homogenous, they would uh, be behave differently the top of the material after it was cured was very light in density the, and the heavier material at the bottom was, was stronger and but also more dense. Um, and, also, and we found that when you compressed this normal material um, it would bend and crack or fail at uh, the sorts of pressures. Um, so I didn't go down that path, I, I knew roughly how they made it and I thought being a diver, there must be an alternative way to um, manufacture this foam. And yeah, it was literally uh, a little bit before Christmas, um, I forget the year, to or eight or something, oh no, it might have been to a nine or so. Uh, we, we thought we could buy this stuff off a shelf, but as I said, you know, the testing, we found it wasn't um, homogenous. Um, so yeah, before telling Jim that we couldn't use um, standard syntactic foam, uh, because it wasn't so much um, we couldn't use it, it was that Jim was fairly insistent that he wanted this syntactic foam to be the structure of a submersible. Um, and you couldn't have a structure that would uh, distort and bend, possibly crack, um, as your chassis for your vehicle. Um, yeah, so, so that was a real limitation. And, and before um, I told Jim that we couldn't, use it using um, uh, conventional foam. Uh, that's when, yeah, I, I went up to a, a local supermarket and I brought a good KitchenAid mix master. It was just <laughs> before Christmas. And I remember the lady at the shop saying, would you like a gift wrap? <laughs> and I said, no, don't worry about it. And I says, oh, you what? It would rather nicely gift wrap. He says, it's not for my wife. <laughs> so that was, um, a little bit of a take there, but uh, uh, anyway, we I took this thing back to the factory and made up my first mix. I had researched some various um, uh, hollow glass microspheres and epoxy resins, and lo and behold, my very first mix um, exceeded the um, pressure rating that we needed, um, and also um, it was homogenous. We checked the density you know, top to bottom and it was absolutely great. Um, the only thing was a little bit too high in density, so we had to modify it somewhat. Um, uh, but finally we got to a, a stage where, um, yeah, we, we had a mix we could use. We, we, could, we had a mix we could build Deep Sea Challenger with. Um, so we had to gear up a, a full-scale manufacturing plant of syntactic foam. And yeah, that's what we did throughout um, probably 210 was um, that concentration of um, um, manufacturing the, the foam for Deep Sea Challenger. That's an amazing story. I mean, a sign of a true innovator starting with a KitchenAid uh, <laughs> mixer and, uh, and then moving into building a whole submersible. So really good story. Yeah. I, I, I guess uh, now knowing what you know and after all your years of experience since since that which really is is one of the biggest feats in the world going at such such depths um, anything you would have done differently now knowing what you know when you did the whole look, design yeah look I think anything that you do uh, for the very first time um, yeah you could always make improvements um, yeah, we've 
continued the business in the you know the deep sea industry um you know we've been able to support various other you know science institutions um also um to a certain degree um, with defense pro um, projects um there's always sort of interest um but yeah i, I think the the technology uh, has further evolved um certainly do things differently uh, but the principles of a synthetic firm uh, remain the same. Um, we are building vehicles um, using foam only as a chassis. Remember, Deep Sea Challenger did not have a, any form of metal or composite chassis. It was purely the synthetic foam. Um, and, yeah, it's been a little bit uh, slow on the uptake, but, um, yeah, we're getting a few projects and... Um, you know, we think, um, you know, others are, are slowly venturing into this space. So that's, um, I think, you know, uh, we did a lot of pioneering work, I, I guess, and, um, you yeah, know, some of that's um, being picked up uh, by, you yeah, the industry. Well, I have to say this. When our, our team reached out to James Cameron and said, we're looking for someone to to talk to us about deep sea exploration, and uh, he said, Ron Allen is the guy. You guys have to talk to Ron. And e even so, you know, there's a couple of quotes that I've seen from James on his experience in working with you. And you sort of segued way into, into space here. And one is, I always said, this is from James Cameron, I always said if I had to go to Mars and I could only take one person with me, I'd want to take Ron. And I also recall him saying that uh, you could probably build a spacecraft on your way to Mars. So I know you've got your business now, you're looking at different things. Are you also venturing into space at all? Uh, yeah, that's um, a, bit, a tough question. Um, I suppose when I grew up, I was, um, yeah, I was looking at, you know, getting into hang gliding, gliding, parachuting. Um, but I really stuck to diving. And it's something that um, I thought I'd concentrate on um, because I felt that I could be good um, as a diver, as a cave diver. Uh, I must be because I'm still here today. Um, whereas I sort of really avoided those other distractions, I, I guess. I would have loved to have ventured into... Um, yeah, the blue skies or, or even space. But um, yeah, for now, it's sort of that, um, I suppose, the inner space, the underwater um, is the intrigue for me at the moment. And um, I've got enough on my plate uh, looking at, <laughs> um, yeah, that environment rather than uh, venturing yeah, outside of the planet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally understand. Well, there's so many synergies between going in the oceans and going into space that uh, one can cross over into uh, into space. Mm. Um, you know, you mentioned that you're the company that you have now, Ron Allen, and um, you've been working with your wife. So it's a family-owned business. You've been working with your wife for some years. And we know from the companies that we work with, there are many family-owned companies um, that are involved in Ocean Tech. So I wonder if you could shed some light on those that are running family-owned businesses, how they, they work professionally and with family to work on such big feats. Any advice you have there? <laughs> um. Uh, look, Yvette has been a rock. Um, she certainly supported the family when uh, we were doing Deep Sea Challenger, as, as well as you know, looking after um, many aspects of the business. Um, the business doesn't su survive if you can't get contracts and you can't get the cash in the door. Um, and yeah, my wife is absolutely a, a rock there. Um, I focus mainly on the, the, the technical. Um, yeah, we've got, um, I don't know, we've had an eye out for a number of staff over the past number of years. It's always been word of mouth. Um, we have an excellent uh, mechanical engineer and uh, electronics engineer and project manager. 
Um, yeah, so I, I think it's a, a combination of just getting, you know, all the right people, um, mm. the right motivation and, uh, you know, have someone, you know, like a vet that can really, you know, go out there and, and do the marketing. So it's absolutely fantastic. Um, it's been pretty tough. <laughs> um, but, yeah, we've now got... Um, uh, yeah, number of clients, and um, yeah, we're we're sort of doing pretty well. Well, just building on that, you guys have had recent success, you and Yvette and your company, in the Deep Ray, um, which is for the Australian defence sector. So, congratulations on that. Uh, wondered if you could just talk to us about what you're developing there and also if you can touch on um, what you see happening in the events sector from an advanced ocean tech point of view. Yeah, um, yeah I just have to be a little bit careful about what I say um, in regard to defense, but um, uh, no, uh, the, the deep ray glider is um, uh, certainly a, a it's not a new um, form of vehicle. Um, it's certainly a, a, a constructed um, in a different method uh, to predecessors, um, yeah, predecessor gliders that um, have been used. Uh, this particular one has quite a, um, a large wingspan. Um, it's certainly built using um, some of the principles that we employed, um, like the, uh, you know, uh, it has a syntactic foam chassis and some of the components are built from syntactic foam. Um, so it was quite a, uh, a novel approach and it, it's, it's sort of a, an example where Defence did, um, I, I suppose, look at upcoming technologies and um, yeah, and engage us to, to, to build a vehicle, a different style of vehicle uh, with new technology. So, yeah, it was quite an exciting uh, number of years. And, yeah, we're uh, looking forward to, um, uh, yeah, continuing that, uh, yeah, that line of work. It's really good. <laughs> That's great. So congratulations on that. I mean, we see the same thing happening in Canada where the defense sector is, is, uh, is focused on using different technologies and, uh, and advancing those within the military. Mm. I've got one last question for you, Ron. So at Quove, one of the things that uh, we're very involved in is uh, working with young talent and identifying careers for them in the ocean tax space. And I read that um, you try to use some of your spotlight to inspire young people. So I wonder if you could just say some lasting inspirational messages for some of those young people that may be watching on what their career opportunities are in Ocean Tech. Oh, <laughs> yeah, actually I'm very proud to say that um, uh, we have one of our daughters now studying mechanical engineering um, and you know, she has uh, started uh, work with us. Uh, so that's, um, that's been a, a great step. Um, I did reach out um, you know, soon after Deep Sea Challenger. It was really, I, I suppose, um, you know, to promote ourselves uh, or this field of work. Uh, there seemed to be a lot of interest in the community, in particular school groups, um, you know, about the deep sea. And, um, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to explain that, um, you know, generally people only see the surface of the ocean. Um, certainly if you fly over it or if you're in a, on a, you know, cruise ship or, or or you know, on holiday or something, you'll see the surface of the ocean, but you don't know what's going on underneath it. And you know, the amount of you know, plastics that are in the ocean um, is now really alarming. Um, you know, there's still a lot, you know, sorry, there are companies that are going to the bottom of the ocean and commencing you know, mining operations. And this is, I don't know, I suppose it's one of those frontiers that are, is invisible and it's not 
as if you can um yeah destroy it you know it's it's mm -hmm. um yeah part of a um yeah the whole ecosystem of the planet um and we've got to protect the oceans so yeah i suppose um yeah i do certainly encourage you know school groups um you know we, we try to you know we, we've got a couple of young staff members on board um you know we're trying to sort of mentor um uh, people into into thinking positively about the ocean and try and give them you know careers um you know in, in this sort of space so yeah um, i'm sort of very much in i suppose an advocate for um you know getting younger people into um you know the marine environment so yeah well <laughs> I'm thank you for something yeah. <laughs> Thank you for all the work you do on that. You're uh, a true ambassador of, of the oceans and and also a true innovator, uh, you know, from starting uh, cave diving to developing submersibles and and your your project with Deep Ray. It's, it's really, really impressive. So really appreciate mm -hmm. the time you've taken with us, Ron, and thank you very much for sharing your insights and your thought leadership uh, for us. And, and uh, thanks again. I hope you really enjoyed today's Ocean Connector with Ron Allum. His career has allowed us to see the de deepest places on the earth. It's amazing to see his work from deep sea diving all the way to now where he's developing advanced technologies for the defense sector. If you'd like to learn more about Ron, please visit his web website at ronallum.com. Also, if you'd like to connect with us, please visit our website at coveocean.com and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thank you very much for joining us today.